Okay, good evening, everyone. Mark Benaziat from the Shooters, Fishers, Farmers Party, a member of the uh, Legislative Council here, coming to you uh, live on Facebook. Um, hope everyone is staying safe uh, during these uh, troubling times. Um, I guess, first of all, I'd like to uh, wish my sincere condolences to uh, anyone that's listening that's lost family members or, or loved ones during this time. Uh, losing anyone. Um, at any time it is tough, but you know, with the restrictions on funerals, um, it's it's even made even more difficult. It's an extra kick in the guts when you lose someone and you can't give them a proper send off. Um, I know what that feels like. I've lost someone recently and, and haven't been able to attend the funeral. So just a sincere condolences from myself. Um, and look, we'll, I guess we'll get straight into it. Um, you yeah, know, we're all here in isolation. Hope everyone's isolation beards are growing, going well. Mine's a little bit average, but we'll we'll keep working on that. Um, so I guess today we'll or tonight we'll, we'll we'll touch on a few things about what's going on, what's been happening, what what's the party been doing, um, and we'll get some questions from you guys at the end. So you know, most of you know I'm a former teacher, so I you know have a great deal to say about education. So I thought we'd start there. Um, there's been a lot of mixed messages from the Premier and from the, the Prime Minister about education, um, you know, particularly about do we go to, do we send kids to school, don't we send kids to school? And uh, that's only causing anxiety and stress amongst parents and teachers and, and, uh, and kids because the messages are mixed, you know, even very at the very beginning when the Prime Minister was saying, you know, send your kids to school, it's the safest place. Um, but then, you know, he was having his own kids, you know, hot, you know hidden away uh, at his house. Um, the Premier has practised their own social distancing uh, about what the Premier, uh, what the Prime Minister has been saying about keeping kids at school. You know, you, li you listen to her messaging and, and some of you have said, well, it's a bit confusing. But, you know, when she came out and said, you know, schools are open, but I encourage everyone to keep their kids at home if possible. You know, as a former teacher, that was a very clear message what she was sending, uh, and that was, we we don't want kids, we don't want kids there. And by me telling you that, uh, you know, you shouldn't send your kids, uh, we'll close the schools by default because attendances will drop so low. Um, so it was a way of the premier actually distancing herself from the, the prime minister's message. Um, and essentially defying what the Prime Minister was saying, um, but without doing it openly. Um, and that's just caused confusion. You know, she's back on there again today talking about, you know, will we reopen them um, in week three of, of this term potentially? Um, and the, but the Prime Minister is out there saying, no, send them to school straight away. And she wants to claim that they're on the same, they're on the same page, but they're not even in the same book. Um, with this message in here, um, you know, the Premier is not clear in terms of how those kids will return back in week three of, of term two. Um, there's no detail. Um, and, you know, without, without the detail, um, she hasn't satisfactorily made the argument for a return to normal operations. Um, if you can't explain how we're going to bring back kids to school and bring back staff and then, and, and move away from uh, this homeschooling operation we've been doing, um, you know, it's it's not going to be done successfully. She's only adding to the stress of parents and, and teachers and, our, and uh, you know, ultimately our kids. Um, so my, my message for her is quite clear. Go back to your comms team, work out exactly what you want to say because at the moment you're not clear at all. Um, you haven't provided any detail about how this will work. Um, you're glossing over the fact that while the while kids might react differently to this virus, you're glossing over the fact that they still can be passive transmitters and we need to look at, you know, the health and well being of our staff, our teachers, our, our teachers' aides, our principals, you know, even our school our school cleaners. Um, so uh, until you come back with a clear plan about how you get kids back to school, um, in an orderly fashion and a, and a, and a planned fashion, um, you, you're just really wasting um, everyone's time um, and just making people more stressed. 
um, I guess, you know, a, a, as a former as a former teacher, um, you know, it, you know, I've had to get back on the tools and, and homeschool my own three kids. And look, to be honest, it's been there was a bit of rust rustiness there. Um, but look, I know I know what it's like in terms of having to try and juggle, you know, the, the kids' school work and, and your own work. So I thought I'd, I'd take a couple minutes, and, and I guess from a former teacher, talk about some, I guess some some tips in terms of dealing with homeschooling um, during this time. And look, by all means, this is not an exhaustive exhaustive sort of uh, list, but just some things that might actually help. Um, so I, you know, I guess one thing is don't don't necessarily adhere to the timetable that's been set by the school if that doesn't work for you. You know, if you're working from home, you might have limited um, technological resources in terms of tablets and computers and 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 the internet. So set a timetable that works for you. It, it doesn't have to be nine to three. Um, it, it, it could be, you know, starting a bit earlier and finishing a bit earlier. It could be starting later and finishing a bit later. You know, scheduling in lots of breaks. Um, and yeah, and I guess the main thing is to make it work uh, within your within your time frame and your timetable as well. Um, so that look, that's an important thing. And look, don't feel the pressure to complete everything that's set for the day. Um, the teachers are doing a great job in trying to um, provide lots of work and catering, catering for all the different abilities of kids, and making sure that uh, you know all you know all, all abilities are catered for. So there's lots of work there. You know, there, there's no pressure there to you know complete all of it. Um, so you know, don't feel bad if if your child doesn't get through it all um, in a day, and you know, set a timetable that works for you. Um, yeah, so look, you know, this thing's still been going on, um, even though we haven't been sitting in Parliament. And I guess, you know, to recap what was sort of happening just before Parliament um, suspended, um, you know, there's been a lot of things going on in the uh, commercial fishing sector. Um, we've had budget estimates just happen recently. Um, and if anyone's been following the stuff that I've been doing in budget estimates, they would know that um, there's been a lot of questions asked about the commercial fishing um, reforms in the commercial fishing sector, as well as the recreational fishing sector. But I guess initially, just to talk about what's been happening commercial fishing wise, um, we, we've seen through budget estimates, there's been a lot of inconsistencies, uh, you know, in terms of answers to questions about these reforms, uh, the question, the figures keep changing in terms of how much money was spent in this uh, share trading scheme that was part major part of the reform. So you know, initially there was documentation um, during the Noel Blair period where he, they were saying that it was 11.6 million dollars was spent. Then it's jumped, you know, to 12, 12.9. Now, now we're looking at, at other figures around 15, 16 million. And then and now the last figure, when I've asked them and further probed them, it's now up to 20.66 million. So the figures keep changing. You know, that's a concern in itself that they can't seem to get their story straight. Um, you know, we've we've raised concerns about the share appeal panel um, during those budget estimates. You know, we had a suspicion that it was flawed, uh, and that's been confirmed through estimates as well as um, talking to fishermen that have had unsuccessful appeals um, through that process. the The truth is, um, sadly to say, that you you can't win through a, a share appeal panel. Um, it's designed for for you to not win. Um, you can't. I can't put it any blunter than that. You know, unless you can prove that the secretary made a calculation error error and failed to carry the one in allocating your your shares, um, there is no other argument to to uh, to base your appeal on. So unless you can prove they made a mathematical uh, error, you're not um, going to win that appeal. And they've openly said in estimates that anyone that won the appeal would cause untold disruption um, because they would essentially have to reissue shares. Um, and obviously, that's not something that they want to do. Um, so my advice is that, you know, in, in terms of the, the share appeal panel, you know, you are possibly going to be wasting a, a lot of money. I, I know I spoke to a commercial fisherman just recently and he spent $6,000 on appealing two or three, 
I guess, um, fishing classes, and he essentially was unsuccessful. Um, you know, and you know, he's, he's wasted six thousand dollars, and he's in no better better position. So I, I would encourage you um, to think very carefully about if you are looking at appealing your shares, um, to think very, very carefully because it's not designed um, uh, for fairness. It's not designed um, to give you a good outcome. Um, so I, I strongly encourage you to look at that and talk to other people that have been through the appeal panel. So um, I guess carrying on, um, you know, a lot of commercial fishermen are concerned about this Barclay report. Now, for those that are um, to a favour, that the, the Barclay report was a socio-economic study that was commissioned by the uh, Minister Marshall um, just recently to look into the impact of the commercial fishing reforms. Now, this was a, this was a socio-economic study that was already supposed to be done. It was promised by the former Minister Noel Blair um, during inquiry. He said it was already there. We now know that it wasn't. Um, and what was there was just a framework on how to do one. Now Marshall has commissioned a study. We, ne we know that it's been sitting on Marshall's desk, completed since early February. Um, and look, if it's an accurate account, it will be scathing. Um, you know, I've been talking to a lot of commercial fishermen over the last 12 to 18 months, and none of them have anything good to say about the commercial fishing reforms. So it, 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 if Dr. Barclay has actually listened and and translated their concerns into this report then it's going to be scathing and you know if it is scathing you know that probably explains why the minister has been sitting on it since february you know there's been lots of calls for him to release it the commercial fishermen have poured their heart and souls out into this you know to dr barclay they deserve to see it um and if it if it's if it is scathing um which i think it is it it, it puts a path forward in terms of how we fix it how we fix this industry and how, and how we make amends for th these government's mistakes um, when they put through this reform. So, you know, I urge Mar uh, Minister Marshall to actually release it. Um, don't do a pavey and apply pressure for, you know, to the author to soften it up. Um, just release it, warts and all. The public deserve to see it, warts and all. So that's happening there. You know, uh, quite a couple of weeks ago, we, um, we put out a release uh, calling for the freeze on uh, rural assistance authority loans for for commercial fishermen, um, because we you know every other every other commercial lender it, it, it is looking at this and negotiating with the people that they've got loans with, and you know we think that the government should be a model a model lender and, and do the same. Um, the commercial fishing industry is, has taken a hard hit through the reforms and now with now with the virus. So we made that call. Um, now, disappointingly, 10 days um, after that, the Daily Telegraph decided to run a story quoting another party. Um, and, you know, which is disappointing since we called for it 10 days earlier. But look, we are still waiting for the government to offer any, any support for commercial fishing um, during, the, during this time. Um, they're, they're sort of slipping through the net, so to speak. So I, I urge the minister to actually act and freeze those RRA loans uh, for, for commercial fishermen. Um, I guess move, moving quickly on to some of the stuff that's been happening in the rec sector. Um, we've had a, a small victory in the battle for Yarra Bay. Now, many of you may know that Yarra Bay is a recreational fishing haven and, and has been for many years. Um, the government has been trying to um, put a cruise ship terminal in there. Um, so it's, um, you know, that's a, that, that's been going on for quite a, quite a while. We've been fighting that along with the Recreational Fishing Alliance and, and quite a, a few different community groups. Um, the fact is it's an idyllic spot. It's fantastic for fishing. It's one of the last sort of spots in that area that rec, rec fishers have access to and this government wants to put a great big dirty cruise ship terminal in. Um, so we've been fighting that pretty hard, but just last week we found that uh, the government's decided to shelve um, any decision on that for 18 months, um, saying that you know there, there is no industry appetite um, to um, look at that. Well, you know, I, we could have told you that you know quite some time ago, and more importantly, th there's not a community appetite 
um, the community in the area is united um, in not wanting that cruise ship terminal there. And, you know, it's it's quite clear. So the, the uh, you know, the message to Andrew Constance, you know, the Minister for Transport in charge of the Port Authority is put your big boy pants on and go talk to fe- go talk to the federal minister and tell him that it's better off being in Garden Island because that's what the re- that's what all the reports say. Um, so we'll we'll keep we'll keep that fight going. Um, you know, we'll keep working with the different community groups to make sure that um, you know that's going. You know, you know that that we'll, that we'll keep fighting. So but that's that's an ongoing battle. But we've had a small win in that we've got them to back off. For at least eighteen months. Um, looks, I guess some other things. It's been it's been quite positive to um, talk to rec, rec anglers and, and hear that they're actually now watching and engaging in the budget estimates process. I've spoken to a, a few of them, and and they've told me that they've had sort of been watching, um, you know, having it up on their screen at work and watching it while they're doing their work and saying that it makes for for good TV and and, and that that's pleasing to hear. And look. You know, a lot of the questions that I've been asking around wreck fishing has come directly from the wreck anglers. So, you know, and that's what I'm about. You know, if the, if my constituents have have concerns, have questions um, that they want answered, that's that's my job is to to ask those questions for them for them in the the forums that I have and uh, get answers for them. So, it's good to hear that they've been watching, and I encourage them to keep watching and keep sending in me in, in questions they want answers to. Um, but we, you know, they have raised concerns around trust funds um, and the admin costs that are blown out. Um, we know into you know under the Bob Carr days there was a promise that admin costs for the Rep Fish Trust would be capped at ten percent. You know, and we now know that they're way way above that. So it's you know it's a concern. Um, you know, the, these trust funds are being funded by. Um, recreational fishers, and if there, you know, if there's a change in in conditions, and there's a change in expenses and costs, then the government, you know, should do its due diligence and, and do the right thing and come back to the to the recreational fish fishermen who are paying for this trust and and, and renegotiate the terms. So that's you know that's going on there. We know that there's some, some concerns about the lack of transparency in in the research. Um, that's coming through uh, DPI and, and being paid for by the trust funds. Um, you know, there's been a, a lot of, I guess, inconsistencies in, in how that research and, and how that consultation has been done around mud crabs and octopus, just to name just to name a couple. You know, we, we've had the recent um, concerns about the Clarence River and. You know, in budget estimates, you know, the DPI admitted that, you know, they could have done the consultation better and there was really no um, up-to-date data on on the mud crabs. The, the, the latest data they could show me was 10, 12 years old. So, you know, I, I don't think that's good. That's good science. I don't think that's good management to be making decisions, A, without consulting everybody and, and B, um, without any sort of up-to-date and accurate science. Um, Look, we, most of you would know my right to fish bill is, um, you know, still going. It's a, it's look, it's a, it's a, it's a big bill, and it took a long time to draft because essentially it's a significant rewrite of the Fisheries Management Act and the Marine Estate Management Act. So that's been second read, um, and, and and can be debated at any time that we choose when we return to Parliament. So. We're still to hear um, from the opposition and, and, and from the government as to what they what they think of it. Um, so I would obviously encourage anyone that supports the right to fish bill um, to contact their local member, whether it's a Labor or, or a Liberal, and, and and pressure them and ask them to support it um, because it's trying to bring positive outcomes um, to um, to both recreational and commercial fishermen. So. But that's um, that's ongoing, and if there's any questions about that bill, I'll, I'll happily take them uh, in a few minutes. So, um, look, a lot of, I guess, a lot of stuff's been um, been going around the media about the, the Ruby Princess, and you know, the call for accountability, and there's been lots of 
talk about inquiries and, and criminal investigations and now commissioners. And um, look, there does need to be some serious investigation um, in, into this, and, but it also, there needs to be investigation into the other ships that ha have uh, docked at the same time. We know at least three other ships docked that same week. We know that there's been uh, deaths from COVID-19 on some of those other ships. And I've been given emails that show, um, particularly on the ovation of the sea cruise ship that arrived on Wednesday, the 18th of March, that they knew that there was a uh, contracted case two days before they disembarked. And uh, they only sent that letter out to passengers on that ship three days after they disembarked. So they disembarked on the Wednesday, they knew on the Monday, and they didn't tell anyone until uh, Saturday morning. Um, and that, that email's right here, clearly, from New South Wales Health. So th there's more to the story than just the Ruby Princess. And while the commission, while the commissioner may only look at the Ruby Princess, and, and while the the uh, commissioner Fuller may only look at the criminal investigation in terms of how the Ruby Princess was handled, the Public Accountability Committee, which is chaired by my colleague Robert Borzak, um, has the ability to look at everything. Um, so he won't, he won't be actually um, restricted and, and limited, and and that's the beauty of the public about the public accountability committee. Um, it was deliberately set up for for issues like this. So, um, it, you know, it, that's an important process, and that and that's ongoing. We have labour support now on that, uh, and that'll be pushing that'll be pushing ahead, um, and that will have the purview to look at. All elements of how um, the government has handled the uh, Ruby, uh, the um, COVID nineteen crisis, not just the Ruby Princess. Um, I guess just briefly touching on, on a couple other things that have been happening. Um, some of you may notice that um, the Deputy Premier and Adam Marshall announced two hundred nine million dollars um, for boundary fencing um, that have been. Um, damaged in bushfires. Now, the, the, their boundary fences with you know Crown land, so local land services, state forests, um, national parks. Now, the reason why they've come out and done done that is because they know that I have a drill bath, uh, a bill drafted ready to go that will mandate um, that Crown land um, has to pay for their share of boundary fences damaged in, in, in bushfires and any other uh, natural disasters. Um, so while their $209 million promised, uh, it, it is great. Um, it's only for this event. But what my bill what my bill does is actually mandate, mandate it for every event. Um, so, you know, that, that's a good win for the community, but my bill will actually make sure that this happens um, on an ongoing basis. So I just uh, one last thing before I, I throw to questions, um, it, it, and it's a and it's a hot topic. Um, it's the uh, koala planning policy that was um, recently announced um, regarding um, how we how we manage koalas and, and rural land. And um, to put it bluntly, it's it's garbage. Um, it needs to be scrapped and started again. It, it, it's it's corrupted science. Um, it, it it talks. It basically says if there's been a sighting um, of a koala 2.5 kilometres within your within your property within the last 18 years, um, then that's enough to justify um, your land being uh, de uh, deemed a uh, koala habitat, and essentially you'll be restricted in, in, in terms of how you manage your own land. Um, and this is including open pasture. Um, and, and, and and just general farming. So you know the, the mapping based on this policy is flawed as well. You know the, the maps are, the maps that they're using are picking up macadamia farms um, and saying that it's core koala habitat. So it's a massive fail by the planning minister. Um, and I urge him to basically go back to the drawing board and and start again. And I know that I've got the backing of the New South Wales farmers. And I've also got the backing of the Timber Association there, and a lot of rural landowners are quite um, annoyed at how they've snuck this through and how it's completely different to what was proposed 
in the draft in 2017. So I guess um, that really covers a, a lot of the things I was going to say. So I will um, throw to some questions that have been asked, um, you know, in the list. So, um, so we've got Mark, Mark Thompson, and he says, um, do you think our rights to hunt are under threat? Well, I guess, Mark, um, being involved in, in, in politics, not only just recently being a member, but in, involved in um, hunting associations for quite some time, I know that our, our rights are constantly under threat. There, you know, there are green bureaucrats that don't like what we do um, and don't think we should be able to do it. So I think our rights to hunt are, co are constantly under threat and we, we do need to be constantly vigilant um, not just as politicians, but uh, as a collective group of hunters um, to make sure that, you know, when there is, when there is a, 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 an impending threat, um, that we come out in numbers and, and we oppose it. Um, so I hope that uh, answers your question. I think, you know, yeah, our rights are always under threat and we always need to be vigilant. Um, uh, so we've got... Um, Tim, Tim Knuckle, he says, Mark, how long can Barely Jicken suspend New South Wales Parliament? And is it worth considering a legal challenge? Government can't, cannot be allowed to continue unchallenged. Um, well, look, the, you know, the, there was a, a set date in terms of the suspension of Parliament, and that was uh, September the 15th. Um, and, and that's... Um, that's a hard date. We, as an upper house, we have the power to actually recall Parliament early, and we've asked for that to be recalled um, early because we, like you, are recognising that um, democracy um, has failed here. Um, they are making some really poor decisions, um, and that's why we sent a we sent a letter to the premier. We sent a letter to all our crossbench members. We sent a letter to the opposition seeking their support for the recall of Parliament. Um, because democracy needs to be uh, restored, and if we're sending, if we're going to send kids and parents and, and teachers to school, then Parliament can be resumed as well. Um, in terms of a legal challenge, I don't, I, I'm not a legal legal, so I, I, I'd have to seek some advice on that. Um, but look, there is a hard date; we can recall it early. It just requires the opposition, that being Labor, to actually be an opposition um, and basically support our call to recall Parliament. Um, I'll keep going down. Glenn Ladford, he uh, asks, are you looking forward to Minister Mitchell's answers to questions on notice on Friday? Look, Glenn, that's a great question. I'm always looking forward to uh, the Education Minister's answers. Um, most, if any of you have followed some of my posts, um, it's one of my favourite pastimes is asking tough questions to the Education Minister and making her look silly. So... I'm super keen to see how she's answered my questions or potentially not answered my questions. Um, and there'll be more to, more to follow up on, on, on those, those answers, I'm sure. And I am sincerely missing making the minister look silly um, in question time. So I can't wait to get back. Uh, look, Adam Martin asks, when the right to fish bill gets up, what can the New South Wales recreational fishing community expect to see with our license fees? And what outcomes can we look forward to from the bill? Um, look, that's a great question, Adam. Um, I guess in terms of what the recreational fishing community uh, can expect to see from the licence fees, it will, it will be about transparency. I just briefly spoke about the uh, concerns about how the trust funds are being um, managed and spent, uh, and there needs to be greater transparency in that. So. Um, what you'll see with the bill is that, they, that those trust funds are properly audited um, and monitored. And, you know, with greater transparency and greater monitoring comes greater outcomes because, you know, your people will see that they're being watched um, and they'll, they'll choose to make better decisions that benefit uh, the recreational fishing community. Um, yeah, I guess one of the other outcomes you can look forward to is actually proper consultation. Um, so one of the big themes throughout the bill um, is actually mandating some standards about consultation um, 
when it comes to any changes um, from you know from a from a fishing perspective so whether it's a closure whether it's you know a, a change of uh, what fishing technique you can use any sort of change that the minister wants to make he needs to come back to the recreational fishing community and and, and have proper consultation um, because we've seen um, historically that this government doesn't do consultation well um, and it, if it does do it if it if it does do it it does it in a very tokenistic way and doesn't necessarily listen to it um, so so that, there's the main i guess the main two outcomes some transparency in how your license fees are being spent and proper consultation with um, the recreational fishing community uh, look, michael cleary asks mark what are your views on the premier's comments that she wants kids to be back in school by wet three of term two this is based on economic reasons and not considering the safety of our children parents and and teachers um well, look, Mike, I think I touched on that in my initial comments. Um, I think the Premier needs to come to us with a clear plan um, as to how they're being returned. Um, is it going to be a staged return like the Teachers' Federation has suggested? Um, is it going to be only for essential workers? Um, none of these details have been fleshed out. Um, so until I, until I see details i'm not satisfied that kids should return at all um because if it's done in an unplanned fashion you know it can have potentially negative outcomes for the for our kids our parents and our and our teachers and that's the last thing we that's the last thing we we need if we are if we have flattened the curve like they say that we we have been um poor decisions and poorly managed um reintegration in i guess in terms of um normal life um could, could have some negative outcomes. So unless, unless she can come to us with some detail, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not entertaining the week three term two. She, she needs to put some meat on the bones with that before, before I'm certainly satisfied as a former teacher. And I know my former colleagues would share that view. Uh, Chris Doff asks, can I drive from Canberra to Yukonbean to go fishing? Um, look, that's, that is a, um, interesting question Chris um, you know the, the information coming out of uh, the DPI is, is a um, a little bit uh, limited and vague they say fishing is okay um, they do stress that traveling um, to the to different regions to go fishing um, is not advised um, and look what I'll do is I'll post a, um, a link to the uh, DPI section that talks about fishing and, and what they say um, in terms of a lot of these questions about can I do this can I travel there can I can I can I do this um, you know I've, I've been asking people to consider um, that it's not going to be me that is making the decision um, whether you, you you follow the health regulations or health orders or not it's going to be a police officer um, and the police officer may or may not show discretion or use discretion um, so you know I would always suggest that you act um, with caution uh, um, when you when you're thinking about what you're doing um, under the under these health orders um, I would love to give you a contrary answer and say yeah go go for it um, but I can't predict what you know a local police officer may or may not um, how they may or may not interpret um, the health orders and look that, that's a problem with how the health orders have been written um, they've been very vague um, so um, look unfortunately I'll, I can't give you a, a concrete yes on that um, but I will post up some information um, in terms of where you can find um, some more details um, about fishing and, and boating etc um, Andrew Baker asks how is Barralara going with the bushfire recovery um, look, that's a great question. I, look, you know, he was very vague in budget estimates when he was asked that question. Um, you know, he said things were were sort of travelling along, but didn't really give any concrete figures. He, he seems a little bit more concerned about you know reinstating the NRL um, than the bushfire recovery um, at the moment, and sort of playing games federally around um, releasing water to farmers um, 
he he likes to do a lot of huff and puff and 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 blowing a lot of um, stuff out of his mouth, but doesn't really like to um, follow it up with that, actually any concrete action. So, you know, um, I don't know how Barilaro is going with bushfire recovery because he's more focused on the NRL. Um, but I'll, I'll certainly ask him um, when I get back what what he's actually doing because that's you know that's one of his main jobs. Um, we've got a question here from Mike Cartwright. He says my my partner is a teacher in high school. She sees 160 different kids a day and has no PPE or sanitary supplies. Is the New South Wales government going to offer PPE to protect teachers and school staff? Look, that's that's a fantastic question, and it and and it speaks to my concerns um, about how we manage the return um, to schools because you know. I've lived and breathed education for 15 years. I know what it, what the public uh, it, school supplies are like in an average school. Um, yeah, quite often uh, you'll be running out of toilet paper and other sanitary supplies. Um, and look, if there is no if there is no adequate PPE um, offered by the government to protect teachers and school staff, then you know that's a big red flag for me in terms of. Um, not allowing teachers and kids to return if if we're not going to offer them proper PPE um, as it you know as the government's not going to offer proper PPE then we're putting ourselves in danger in terms of breaching WHS um, and but more importantly um, we're putting the lives of teachers and school staff and our kids at at risk um, there needs to be adequate PPE um, whether that's whether that's masks whether that's hand sanitizer. Um, you know, I've been sent emails and pictures from from teachers um, before schools were closed down, and they, and they were giving given a, a small two hundred mil um, bottle of hand sanitizer, and that was supposed to do you know all of them, um, their kids, them, um, you know, for for six hours of the day, um, five days of the week. Um, so, look, I'll, I'll be urging the New South Wales government to consider. PPE um, in any plan to um, um, bring back uh, kids to school and bring back teachers and staff to school. Um, Heather Elliott asks, how do we hold the government accountable when they lie in budget estimates? Now, I, had, I think Heather is uh, referring to um, questions around commercial fishing and, and the inconsistencies in what they've been saying um, you know, in terms of answers to my my questions, and look, it, it is a concern when there is those inconsistencies, uh, and particularly inconsistencies with what the former minister said in a former inquiry, what he said in the house, and then what's now been told to us now. Um, look, there are there are provisions um, for you know dealing with this, and and uh, you know having seen the answers that have come back um, to me in budget estimates, um, I, I will be. I'll be looking and talking, talking to the clerk of parliament, um, and seeing how we how we can can deal with it. Um, I, go, I gave them every opportunity to, to uh, be honest and open about what's happened here and and what's happened with the reforms. Um, so it's now time to actually um, to act on that, those inconsistencies, and that's what I'll that's what I'll be doing um, when we get back to parliament. Daniel um, Spears has asked, "How do we push DPI to reopen state forest for hunting?" Well, that's um, that's another great question. We, um, you know, it was on again, off again. Um, there was a lot of toing and froing about whether state forest would be open, um, and then they suddenly closed it and said, "No, we're going to close it because a lot of people travel to hunt." Um, my colleague Robert Borzak has just sent a letter um, to Minister Marshall. Um, urging he, him to reconsider opening the state forests um, for hunting because most of us do know that state, you know, hunting is largely a solitary thing, just like fishing, um, and you know, and just like golf, you can you can practice social distancing um, while out hunting. Um, and in fact, it, for me, it's the ultimate social distancing. It's it's quite enjoyable to sit out there by myself. So, in terms of what we can do, um, well, as a party, we've already sent that letter and we're already applying pressure. Um, and I would encourage. All the hunters out there to send send a letter to the local member, send a letter to Minister Marshall. Um, 
calling them for them to be reopened. Um, it can be managed sensibly, um, and um, you know we, we firmly believe it. It, it, it should be um, open. Um, we have Stan Constant Taurus. He says, "Hi, Mark. Can we get you to confirm with Minister Constance what an 18-month delay on the cruise ship terminal means? Is all consultative, consultative work stopping, or just community consultation? Will his department continue working on the business case behind the scenes? Um, look, most definitely. Um, yeah, even though Parliament has been suspended, um, we have the opportunity to still write." Uh, written questions to the ministers. We can send emails. We can um, talk to their their chief of staff if need be. So that yeah, look, that I indeed can ask that question, and I will ask that question um, for you, Stan, and and for all the community groups that are concerned about that cruise ship terminal. Um, well, look, that um, sort of come comes to the end of all the all the questions that I've received. Um, look, I thank you for y y your time and I hope it's been enjoyable and insightful. Um, look, if there's anything that you want myself or some of my other members um, to talk about in these Facebook Live uh, uh, things that we're doing, um, look, drop the party a line, drop a, drop a message on my Facebook group, um, on my Facebook page, and um, just um, tell us what you, you'd like to hear or, or what you'd um, like us to talk about. Um, so uh, until next time, um, stay safe. Thank you.